good morning we begin our discussions on root finding problems this involves development of numerical techniques for solving equations of the form f of x is equal to 0 where f is a real valued function of a real variable and it depends on a single real variable x. Where do we come across such equations and what is the necessity for developing numerical techniques for solving these equations? Let us see some examples. The population growth for a short period of time can be modeled by assuming that the population growth varies continuously with time and the rate at which this population growth varies is proportional to the number of population present at that time say t. Suppose say I denote by n of t the population at time t and by nu the constant immigrants are permitted and if lambda denotes the constant birth rate of this population then the population model can be given by the following differential equation namely the rate at which the population varies is equal to <coughs> lambda times n of t plus the immigration that is permitted namely the constant rate nu. This being a first order differential equation the solution can be written down and the solution is say n naught e to the power of lambda t plus nu by lambda into e power lambda t minus 1. And what is n naught? n naught is the population at initial time. Suppose say initial population n naught is say some 10 lakhs and that the immigrants in this year turns out to be say some 4 lakh 85 thousand and at the end of one year the population is say some 15 lakhs 75,896 and this is the population at the end of one year. Then if I substitute these details here then I get 15,75,896 must be equal to n naught which is 10 lakhs. Multiplied by e to the power of lambda t. So, in one year this has happened plus new immigrants the data given is 4 lakhs 85 thousand that is new divided by lambda multiplied by e to the power of lambda again t is 1. So, e power lambda minus 1. So, we observe that we have an equation involving lambda which is the birth rate of the population in that year and we do not know what it is and we have to determine this lambda and we observe that this equation is of the form f of lambda equal to 0. So, I need to obtain a solution of this equation and determine what lambda is. There are various physical situations 
where we come across equations of different forms. Say for example, in the case when we study diffraction of light, we come across an equation of the form x minus tan x is equal to 0, where we are required to determine what this angle x is. Or when we study central orbits, we come across Kepler's equation which is of the form x minus a sin x is equal to b, where we are required to determine this x for different values of a and b. So, we do come across different forms of equations involving exponential functions or trigonometric functions or the some equation may involve logarithmic functions or it may purely be an algebraic uh, uh, equation involving polynomials. And so, the problem is to obtain a solution of this equation which can be expressed in the form f of x is equal to 0. And the numerical techniques that we are going to discuss in the next few classes can be used to generate approximate solutions of such equations f of x is equal to 0 when one is unable to determine analytically the closed form solution of such equations. So, what is the problem which is in our hand? The problem is as follows namely given a function f from r to r a real valued function of a real variable determine values of x determine values of x for which f of x is 0 this is what we need to answer or we need to find out. So, let us see how we can do it. The roots of the equation roots of f of x is equal to 0 are also called the zeros of the function f. So, let us see some simple examples. Suppose say this equation f of x is equal to 0 is a linear equation of the form a x plus b equal to 0, where a and b are real with a different from 0. Then immediately we can write down the solution in the form minus b by a. Suppose I consider a nonlinear equation of the form say a x square plus b x plus c equal to 0, then I see that this is a quadratic equation and so I can write down the solutions in the form x 1 is equal to minus b plus r plus root of b square minus 4 a c by 2 a and the second solution is minus b minus root of b square minus 4 a c divided by 2 a. So, I am able to express the solution of this nonlinear equation involving radicals namely square root of the sums of product of the coefficients a b c that appear in this nonlinear equation. Such a thing is also possible in the case of cubic equations and quartic equations. However, for polynomial equations of the form f of x is equal to 0, whose degree n is greater than or equal to phi, no such closed formula exists. So, that the solution can be expressed in terms of the radicals. In fact, for each value of n greater than or equal to phi, it is possible to find polynomial equations involving integer coefficients such that one cannot find the solution of such equations in terms of radicals. For example, consider this 
equation x power 5 minus 4 x minus 2 equal to 0. The coefficients are integers. It is not possible to obtain a solution of this fifth degree polynomial equation in terms of the radicals. So, we are faced with the following question. How can we decide whether a given equation f of x is equal to 0 has a root? And if it has a root, then how can we find out? So, we are faced with these two questions and therefore, our goal now is to develop numerical methods for obtaining approximate solutions of equations of the form f of x is equal to 0, where f is a real valued function of a real variable defined on a closed bounded interval and f is a continuous function. So, having this goal, let us start defining some simple terms which we use in our discussion. What do we mean by a root of the equation f of x is equal to 0? So, by a root of f of x is equal to 0, we mean that real number p that real number p for which f of p is identically 0. And if p is a root of this equation f of x is equal to 0, then p is said to be said to be a root of multiplicity m if f of x can be expressed in the form x minus p to the power of m into some q of x where q at p is different from 0. So, this definition will help us to determine what is the multiplicity, multiplicity of the root of that equation f of x is equal to 0 if p is a root of that equation. Suppose say if f of x is a polynomial equation and we can factor the polynomial in the form x plus alpha to the power of m 1, x minus beta to the power of m 2 and x minus gamma to the power of m 3. Then it is immediate that this equation f of x is equal to 0 has a root of multiplicity m 1 at x is equal to minus alpha and it has a root of multiplicity m 2 at x is equal to beta. It has a root of multiplicity m 3 at x is equal to gamma. So, in this case it is very simple provided the polynomial can be factored in this form. Suppose I consider say an equation of the form f of x is equal to 2 x plus log 1 minus x by 1 plus x and I want you to find a root of this equation and determine its multiplicity. Then let us look at the equation we observe that x is equal to 0 is a root of the equation because it is identically satisfied f of 0 is 0 that is clear it is immediate. So, x is equal to 0 is a root the question is what is its multiplicity. So, let us try to answer that and we have the following theorem which comes to our rescue. It states let f be continuous with m continuous derivatives. A root x is equal to p 
of f of x is equal to 0 is said to be of multiplicity m m if f at p f dashed at p and so on up to p minus up to m minus 1th derivative up at p are 0 and the mth derivative at p is different from 0. We just have to check whether this happens given an equation of the form f of x is equal to 0, where f is continuous and f possesses continuous m derivatives. And if we see that p is a root of the equation f of x is equal to 0, check whether the first m minus 1 derivatives at p are 0 and the mth derivative is different from 0. If this happens, then we conclude that x is equal to p is a root of this equation of multiplicity m. So, let us see whether we can make use of this result and determine the multiplicity of the root x is equal to 0 of this equation. So, we, we have determined what the root is namely x is equal to 0 is a root and therefore, f of 0 is 0. So, let us compute f prime. What is f of x? It is 2 x plus log 1 minus x by 1 plus x. I rewrite this as 2 x plus log 1 minus x minus log 1 plus x. Now, I compute f dash of x and that will be 2 plus 1 by 1 minus x into derivative of 1 minus x minus 1 by 1 plus x. So, let us find what f prime 0 is. So, that is going to be 2 minus 1 minus 1 and that is 0. Let us see what happens to f double prime x. So, this will give me minus minus 1 by 1 minus x the whole square into minus 1 then minus minus 1 by 1 plus x the whole square. So, this gives me minus 1 by 1 minus x the whole square plus 1 by 1 plus x the whole square and so if I compute f double prime at 0 that again is 0. Let us now see what is f triple prime of x. So, this will give minus 2 by 1 minus x the whole cubed into minus 1 minus 2 by 1 plus x the whole cubed and we evaluate f triple prime at 0 and that will give you minus 2 minus 2 which is minus 4 and it is different from 0. We see that the equation f of x is equal to 0 has a root at x is equal to 0 and f prime 0, f double prime 0 are all zeros, but f triple prime 0 is different from 0. The given equation f of x is equal to 0 has x is equal to 0 as a root of multiplicity 3 as a root of multiplicity 3. So, now we know what we mean by a root of the equation f of x is equal to 0 and how we can determine the multiplicity of this root. We now move on to techniques for finding such a root of a given equation f of x is equal to 0 and the techniques belong to two categories namely the methods are either enclosure methods or they are fixed point iteration methods.
So, we shall first focus our attention on enclosure methods. The enclosure methods are based on the result from intermediate value theorem. So, let us just recall intermediate value theorem and see how the result given there helps us to find an interval that encloses a root of the given equation f of x is equal to 0. Intermediate value theorem states that if f is a continuous function over the closed interval a b and k is any real number that lies between f of a and f of b, then there exists a real number c which lies between a and b such that f of c is equal to k. So, if f is a continuous function defined in this interval a b and k is any real number which lies between f of a and f of b, then there exists a real number c between a and b such that f of c is equal to k. Let us now see a consequence of intermediate value theorem, which says if f is a continuous function in the closed interval a b and f of a into f of b is negative, then f must have a 0 in the interval a b. Let us try to understand this result. So, we have a continuous function f defined on the closed interval a b and it is such that f of a into f of b is negative. So, without loss of generality let us take f of a to be positive and f of b to be negative. So, if I draw the graph of the function a passing through the points a comma f of a and b comma f of b, then I observe that the graph crosses the x axis at some point say p. This is the x axis. What does that mean? At p, what is the value of f? It is 0. So, f of p is 0 and therefore, p is a 0 of the function f. Where does the 0 appear occur? It occurs in the open interval a b. So, this is a very nice result which will help us to locate the interval within which the root of the equation lies and that is why we say the first class of methods that enable us to develop a numerical algorithm for determining approximate solutions as enclosure methods. The methods help us to find out an interval that encloses a root of the equation f of x is equal to 0. So, we describe one such enclosure method now which is called the bisection method. So, what happens when f of a into f of b is negative? f changes its sign as it moves from a to b and therefore, f has a 0 in the interval a b. Let us take the following example. Suppose f of x is x cubed plus 2 x square minus 3 x minus 1 and the function it is defined in the interval minus 4 to 3. So, let me evaluate f at minus 4 and that turns out to be minus 21 and f at minus 3 is minus 1 and f at 3 if I evaluate at the other end point it turns out to be 35. So, I immediately conclude 
that f of a into f of b is negative. So, there is a root between minus 4 and 3 for this equation f of x is equal to 0. Let us see whether there are some more zeros in this interval for this equation. f of minus 3 is minus 1 and if I compute f of minus 2 it is 5. And so, again I conclude that there is a root between minus 3 and minus 2 because f of a into f of b is negative. Let us now evaluate f at minus 1 and that turns out to be 3 and f at 0 is minus 1. So, again the sign changes. So, there is a root between minus 1 and 0 and let us see what is f at 1 it is minus 1 and f at 2 is 9 and there again what happens the sign changes and therefore, there is a root between minus there is a root between 1 and 2. So, f is defined in the interval minus 4 to 3. So, within that interval I observe that there is a, an interval minus 3 to minus 2, minus 1 to 0 and 1 to 2 in each of which there is a 0 of this function f. So, how have we determined these zeros? We have made use of the result which is a consequence of the intermediate value theorem. So, at this stage we shall see some enclosure methods that will enable us to obtain approximate solutions of equations of the form f of x is equal to 0. One such method is the bisection method. So, we shall now describe this method and try to see how we can use this method to find an approximate solution of the equation f of x is equal to 0 namely a root of the equation f of x is equal to 0. Let us consider the bisection method. So, given the equation f of x is equal to 0 and an interval a b in which f is defined such that f of a into f of b is less than 0. Then we try to determine a root of this equation f of x is equal to 0 by the following way namely we denote this interval a b by a 1 b 1 and find the midpoint a 1 plus b 1 by 2 and call it as p 1. We know that a root of the equation lies in this interval because f of a into f of p is negative. So, I have called this as a 1 and this as b 1. I determine p 1 which is the midpoint of this interval. I know that f of a into f of b is negative. Having determined p 1, I check what is f of p 1. f of p 1 is going to be either positive or negative. If suppose f of p 1 is positive, then in that case I have f of p 1 into f of b 1 to be negative. So, this interval encloses a root of the equation f of x is equal to 0. So, in this case I have my interval p 1 b 1 that encloses a root of the equation or if f of p 1 is negative then in that case where does the root lie? f of a 1 into f of p 1 is 
negative and therefore, a root lies in the interval a 1 to p 1. So, in this case the interval that encloses the root is a 1 to p 1. Whatever be the case I am able to determine another interval either p 1 b 1 or a 1 p 1 in which a root of the equation lies. So, I shall call the interval as a 2 b 2. So, what do I do? I call p 1 as a 2 and b 1 as b 2 in this case. If it is this case then I call a 1 as a 2 and p 1 as b 2. So, I now move to the next step. What is the next step? At this step I have an interval a 2 b 2. I know what are they? I have already determined by arguing out in this way. So, at this stage I have an interval a 2 b 2 which encloses a root of this equation. So, what do I do? I am determining the midpoint of this interval which is a 2 plus b 2 by 2 and evaluate what is f at p 2. Namely, if it is greater than 0 and I observe that f of p 2 is greater than 0 and so a root lies in this interval namely p 2 to b 1. On the other hand, if f of p 2 is negative then in that case suppose f of p 2 is negative then I observe that f of p 1 into f of p 2 is negative. So, a root lies in this part of the interval namely it is between p 1 and p 2, but I had called p 1 as a 2. So, it lies between a 2 and p 2. Now, I check what happens if f of p 1 is less than 0 and I take a 2 b 2 as this interval. Again I compute p 2 which is the midpoint and check whether a root lies in this part of the interval or in the other part of the interval. So, every time I determine an interval which encloses a root of this equation and every time I obtain the interval in such a way that its length is half of the length of the interval in the previous step. See in the first step a 1 b 1 is the interval the width is b 1 minus a 1. In the second step what is by a 2 b 2 it is either this or this what is p 1 it is the midpoint of the interval a 1 b 1 and so what is the length of this interval a 2 b 2 it is half of the length of the interval a 1 b 1. In the next step I have a p 2 what is the length of the interval which encloses a root it is half the length of this interval. So, it is 1 by 2 squares times the length of the original interval and that is at the second step. So, in the first step the length of the interval at that step is half of the length of the original interval. In the second step the length of the interval which encloses a root is 1 by 2 square times the length of the interval a 1 b 1 namely the original interval. In the third step the interval is going to be further halved. So, it is going to be 1 by 2 cubed times the length of the interval a 1 b 1 and so on. So, every time I determine an interval that encloses a root and find out what the midpoint is. Namely, I bisect the interval by that midpoint and find that part of the interval in which a root lies. So, I continue to do this and every time I obtain the midpoint and I call that midpoint p n which I obtain at the 
nth step as an approximation to a root of the equation. Why? What is the reason? Let us see f of a 1 into f of b 1 is negative. So, the actual root lies here. Suppose I call this as p. What is the first case? f of p 1 is positive. Suppose p 1 is this midpoint, f of p 1 is positive, then where does the root lie? It lies in this portion of the interval and you see that I have come closer to the root of the equation, the actual root p of the equation. In the next time, since f of p 1 into f of b 1 is negative, a root lies here and therefore, the midpoint p 2 of this interval is here and I evaluate what is f of p 2 and I see f of p 2 is negative, f of p 1 is positive. So, a root lies in this portion. I choose the midpoint that is p 3. I evaluate f of p 3 that is negative, this is positive. So, a root lies in, in the interval p 1 to p 3 right? and I determine the midpoint which I call as p 4. If f of p 4 is positive and a root lies between p 4 and p 3. So, every time I reduce the length of the interval enclosing root of the equation and closer and closer to the root of the equation. This the method that we have described now is what is called the bisection method and it is an enclosure method because at every step we obtain an interval that encloses a root of the equation f of x is equal to 0. Now, the question is where do we stop? How many steps should we continue to arrive at a root that is closer to the exact value of the root of the equation? This is just an approximation. So, the bisection method generates a sequence of iterates for the root of the equation. The question is does this sequence converge? If it converges, does it converge to the exact root of the equation f of x is equal to 0? And what is the what is the rate at which this convergence takes place? Is it faster? or slower all these questions have to be answered and we will continue in the next class.